Oui, bonjour, welcome back. Yes, that was the music in the background. So if you're still getting your cup of coffee or your cup of water, whatever it is, um, it's time to come back and join us. Um, we are rolling right, around, right along today uh, with another uh, panel discussion. Now, uh, this, this, this next panel's discussion is about diversity and heritage. It's the initiatives in the heritage preservation of the diverse communities in Manitoba. Um, our uh, moderator for this talk uh, is uh, Chris Antong. Now, I'm not sure if I pronounced it properly, Chris, so please do correct me. Oh, I got it. He's giving me the thumbs up. C'est bon. Uh, well, le let me uh, give you a little bit more about Chris here. Uh, he Chris immigrated to Canada in uh, 2010 with his wife, uh, Piggy. P P I got that wrong. P-E-G-Y. So when you can't pronounce it, you spell it out for everybody. Um, settling in uh, Steinbach, Manitoba, he became an active member of the local community, uh, talking, uh, taking on the role of the president of the Southeast Manitoba Filipino Association from 2017 to 2019. Currently, he sits on an executive board as the Filipino Music and Arts Association of Canada and uh, is the interim vice president for program and media of the Philippine Heritage Council of Manitoba. Um, he's also uh, writes an English uh, column for the Manitoba Filipino Journal. Chris, so happy to have you as the moderator. I'm going to let you present your own guests and um, it's, all, it's, it's all up to you now. What else? Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rob. It's a difficult act to follow, especially with the musical number like that. Uh, good morning to everyone uh, participating in today's summit. Let me just say it's a tremendous privilege to be part of this event and this particular discussion about diversity in heritage, focusing on initiatives in the heritage preservation of the diverse communities in Manitoba. In keeping with the brisk pace of today's program, I will be proceeding with the first panelist, Perla Havate. Perla Havate is a social worker from the Philippines. She is a retired community liaison officer from the Winnipeg School Division. She is currently the president of the Philippine Heritage Council of Manitoba Incorporated and the Coalition of the Filipino Canadians for Stronger Families Incorporated. She initiated uh, and is a founding member of Pinais MB, a Filipino women's group. Perla's passion is in the maintenance and preservation of Philippine heritage and culture, in promoting multiculturalism, in working with newcomer immigrants and refugees and women. She is currently co-chair of the Ethnocultural, Ethnocultural Council of Manis Manitoba, Stronger Together Incorporated. So friends and colleagues, please join me in welcoming my colleague at the PHCM, Perla Havate. And you can unmute your uh, microphone now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Chris, for that uh, you know, thorough introduction. <laughs> I would like to start by giving you a glimpse of the Philippine community in Manitoba, how it all started and how it has become what it is today. Immigration of Filipinos in Manitoba started only in 1959 with the arrival of five nurses who were hired by Mr. Cardio Hospital. So more nurses and doctors came after exiting from the United States and settled here in Canada. Some re-entered the United States, but others stayed and settled in Canada. It was also a time when teachers came in to fill in needs of teachers, especially in the reserves. In the 1960s, the garment industry in Winnipeg was flourishing and there was a need for garment workers. So they started recruiting from the Philippines and the first group came in 1968. More groups came after, and a total of 1,200 came from the Philippines through this route. Other groups came after arriving in Manitoba to our 
groups of garment workers coming from the Netherlands. This group came on their own. I was part of the waves of garment workers that arrived in Manitoba through the Netherlands. Uh, I was social worker for a group of young women, ages 18 to 20 then, and uh, were uh, hired by uh, Silpit Industries here when I asked somebody to uh, come and offer the girls uh, work at that time. It's, it was easy to come into Canada through a work visa. So uh, imagine coming in with 92 girls in 1976. And at this point in time, this 92 women with their families here and uh, you know, their extended families. So imagine multiplying it 10 times. And I, I say that's my contribution to Canada. Uh, these waves of garment workers were mostly single women. Some of them had professions from the Philippines that downplayed their qualifications so they can emigrate, travel, and with a hope for a better future. Family reunification opened up in the late 70s, and that is when our numbers soared. Parents, siblings, boyfriends, and other relatives came, and international adoption was also open. So single, single women adopted nieces and nephews from the Philippines so they can help out families from the Philippines. With the changes of immigration policies based on the demands of the market and with the introduction of provincial nominee program, there has been shifts in the criteria of immigrants arriving from the Philippines. So we have gone through recruitments of nurses, healthcare workers, domestic workers, temporary foreign workers. And now the pathway they use is through international student visas so that they can bring their families and children and then eventually settle as permanent residents. As you see, where there is an available pathway, immigration from the Philippines continues to flow. Today, we are about 83,000 Filipino Canadians in Manitoba. Our province is the largest concentration of Filipinos per capita in Canada. Filipino language is the second most used language in Manitoba and fifth in all of Canada. Concentration of Filipinos in Winnipeg is in the northwest end of the city, although we can also say we are all over the city. Our presence is also felt in other smaller cities and towns like Steinbach, Brandon, Port East La Prairie, Nipawa, Dauphin, and Russell, and a spattering of Filipinos in smaller towns. The impact of Filipinos in Manitoba is seen and felt in all aspects of life, in education, in politics, in business, in entertainment, in religious spheres. This tells us that the Philippine culture is alive, vibrant, and well in Manitoba. Before and hopefully post-COVID, weekends, regardless of whether it's spring, summer, winter, or fall, is bustling with socials, parties, celebrations, usually expression of a cultural practice such as celebration of seventh birthday or the booth for an 18 year old or any reason to celebrate at all. So come summertime, fiestas, festivals, special religious celebrations, Philippine independence celebration, Poklorama, and many others keep the Philippine community preoccupied, busy, vibrant, and joyful. So at any time and any day, one feels like eating Philippine specialty dishes. You do not have to travel far. You have a takeout joint or restaurant somewhere close by, and it just feels like home. You can actually have anything at all you crave for. Aside from Catholic churches and other Christian churches, we have over 25 local religious denominations, some of them using Filipino as their medium. We definitely made a difference in meeting the spiritual needs of the community. Our services are well attended because it is very much part of our family life. 
the Philippines is the only Christian nation in Asia. In the entertainment field, we have homegrown talents who are making it in national and international stage. This is one area that creates a lot of excitement in our community. Many families have karaoke machines, so any social gatherings, big or small, singing and dancing are very much part of it. So we can say at this point in time that our culture and heritage has been kept alive and nurtured by the various groups and organizations in the Philippine community. We probably have over 100 organizations in the community, regional and linguistic groups, professional groups, interest groups, church groups, name it, and most likely we have one somewhere. One may ask why so many? For us, it makes sense because the Philippines is made up of 7,100 islands and 81 dialects. We have varying cultural practices, values, customs, and traditions. And you'll find out when you get the chance to travel in the Philippines. However, the very fact that there are so many of us doing our own thing, it makes it challenging to make a unified effort in preserving our culture. We are fortunate that since the 70s, we had a community paper that we can use as a resource and other papers came about later. We had a TV, two TV programs in the 80s and a radio program that was launched in the 80s that still exists until now. And uh, technical, technological advances in social media. We are lucky to have podcasts now as another popular means of, of you know, reaching out to the community. And uh, Chris, our Chris Anton here has uh, one of that that uh, actually covers uh, uh, a lot of issues, uh, not only uh, provincial wide, but nationally. The Manitoba Filipino Association of Filip Filipino Teachers, a partner organization has a clear mandate of preserving our language offering after-school Filipino classes to anyone interested in the school system. Adult classes are also being offered to the wider community for anyone who's interested to learn our language. The Philippine Heritage Council of Manitoba, our main objective is the maintenance, promotion, and preservation of our culture. It is comprised of about 28 organizations working together to deliver programs during our Philippine Heritage Month in June of every year. We start our month long festivities with a flag raising ceremony attended by representatives of the various organizations we have. The Philippine Independence Ball is one of the highlights where um, it's a big uh, formal gathering where we commemorate uh, the independence of the Philippines uh, from 300 years of colonization. And this is where we showcase our special talents. And uh, you, know, you can also see a variety of Philippine costumes, both for men and women at its best. An event is usually held in one of the schools to give our Filipino students a chance to share their culture with the whole school, and this helps our students feel good about their Filipino heritage. A celebration of faith is organized to allow our pastors from the various churches to work together and have a joint celebration of scripture reading and songs to honor our Christian heritage. We pray for the Philippines, for Canada, and for the whole world. One event that takes place during our Philippine Heri Heritage Month to commemorate the fact that we are a multicultural, we are part of a multicultural society. We do have sharing sessions with one other community group in Winnipeg. Uh, it is our outreach program to get to know our brothers and sisters from other countries. 
The week long and now the month long festivity usually end with a picnic in the park, wherein the Philippine Heritage Council of Manitoba hosts a community gathering in the park with free lunch and entertainment, giving a semblance of what a fiesta atmosphere is. This activity is open to the whole community. During the pandemic, we managed to hold the virtual independence celebration where we partnered with the uh, Barangay Philippines hosted by uh, Chris. We were able to feature our talents again and offer something special to our community. We also launched a series of podcasts in partnership with Barangay Philippines again on Philippine customs and traditions. And it is our hope that we can have this as part of our oral stories that can serve as reference for future use. Our heritage and culture is alive and well, and it will be fueled by the continuous flow of newcomers, newcomer Filipinos. We are now on our fourth, going on our fifth generation, and we have to think of how we can keep our children connected and engaged with their culture so they feel good about their identity. We have a Philippine Canadian Center of Manitoba, but the way it's set up at the present time, it's more a business center than a cultural center. So moving forward, we are in the process of inviting like-minded individuals to start dreaming of a cultural hub, a resource in a cultural center, which can be a source of information for anyone wanting to know about the Philippine community and the Philippines, a place where you can house exhibits, special projects about the Philippines, and most importantly, a place where our children and find out about their heritage. We are also at a stage where we have to make sure our history, the history of the Philippine community in Manitoba is written in its entirety, acknowledging our pioneers, the challenges and successes and the ups and downs of our journey as a community. Thank you so much for this chance to share something about our community. It allowed me myself to reflect on our journey as a community. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. And thank you very much as well, Perla Habate, or as I call her, Tita Perla, which means aunt in the Filipino culture, for sharing about the history and the current status of the Filipino Manitoban heritage community. And also, thank you for the generous mentions of my video podcast, Barangay <laughs> Canada. Barangay means community in the Filipino language. Moving on, our next speaker is Arthur Mickey. Dr. Art Mickey is an active leader in the Japanese can Canadian community, having served as president of the National Association of Japanese Canadians from 1984 to 1992. He led the negotiations to achieve a just redress settlement for Japanese Canadians interned during the Second World War. He and his family were forcibly relocated to Manitoba sugar beet farms in 1942. For his efforts nationally, provincially, and locally, he has received this country's highest recognition, the Order of Canada, the Order of Manitoba, and recently received the Order of the Rising Sun from the government of Japan. He received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Winnipeg. Art is past president of the Japanese Cultural Association of Manitoba and the, and the Asian Heritage Society of Manitoba. With the Asian Heritage Society, Art has organized high school symposiums on Asian heritage and is involved with anti-Asian racism activities. He is advisor to the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Art is a former teacher and principal, a uh, Canadian citizenship judge, and a lecturer at the University of Winnipeg. So friends and colleagues, let's all welcome Arthur Mickey. Thank you, Chris. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm just wondering, I have a PowerPoint presentation and uh, whether we could show that or not. Uh, uh, unfortunately, from my end, I can't seem to uh, do it, but uh, if there are technology people there, 
uh, at your end, I'm wondering uh, whether we could uh, put it on. So I'll just uh, let them figure it out as I uh, do a little bit of introduction. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm involved with the Japanese Canadian uh, Cultural Association of Manitoba. We're located at 180 McPhillips Street in Winnipeg, and we have our own cultural center. And one, a number of things that have occurred, our community has been in Winnipeg since 1942. Uh, that's when they were forcibly removed from the West Coast as a result of the uh, the war, uh, Canada declaring war on Japan. And as a result, the government uh, not only confiscated properties belonging to Japanese Canadians, but also removed them from their homes and forcibly removed them from the West Coast and put them to internment camps. However, there are some people who uh, came to Manitoba uh, because at that point in time, there's a shortage of labor here in Manitoba. And as a result, uh, what happened? Uh, oh, is it hard? Are you able to? Can you try again? I unfortunately, uh, I, I I can't seem to get it because I'm not that up on the uh, technology part of it. So I'll just continue. Anyways, uh, as a result of that, uh, oh, uh, they're showing something now, which is the. Uh, um, history of Manitoba. So let me just continue. Um, as a result of uh, uh, the internment, uh, my family chose to come to Manitoba. Uh, well, here we have the information now. So we chose to come to Manitoba uh, because there's a shortage of labor. And the reason they decide to come here is because if you came as a family, you could stay together. However, people who were sent to internment camps uh, were separated from their families. The men were separated from the women and children and the elderly. And as a result, that separation caused a lot of hardships within many families. So the, we came to Manitoba in 42 in May and uh, we were placed on Sugar Beef Farm in St. Agathe's, Manitoba, uh, where we, uh, uh, stayed there for two years before we moved into uh, the outskirts of Winnipeg. In uh, Winnipeg was out of bounds for Japanese. In fact, it was illegal for Japanese to live in Winnipeg. So we moved into uh, North Kildona, which was at that point in time, uh, not part of the city of Winnipeg. And that's what many people did. And uh, so you'll see that uh, we have uh, on the screen, uh, uh, one of the projects that we've been working on is a mural of uh, Japanese in Manitoba. And this mural was created by an artist uh, from Vancouver, with certainly the help of uh, myself, who provided all the uh, data for the information to go into it. And this panel, rather than uh, creating a museum kind of piece, we decided to go with something that would be more attractive for younger people. So we use the approach uh, uh, that uh, a lot of authors use today, uh, uh, the storybook kind of uh, images. And so uh, the first panel that you see is where I was referring to the movement of uh, Japanese from the West Coast uh, into Manitoba. So if we could second, show the second panel, uh, yeah, the second panel gives uh, an idea of the sugar beet uh, uh, farm. It's uh, usually the homes that people lived in were uninsulated, no water, no electricity. I remember the house that we lived in in St. Agas. Uh, there were three families sharing a four-room house uh, with no water at all uh, or sewer or and no insulation as well. So it made it very difficult and it was hard for people. And so uh, after the first year, we had to move into a different place. It was just unbearable. Well, and so sugar bees is very difficult work. And although many of the people who came from British Columbia, such as my grandfather, he owned a berry farm and berry farming and strawberry farming is not quite like sugar bee farming, which is a uh, very backbreaking work. Panel three, uh, 
shows people beginning to move into Winnipeg. When the war ended, uh, essentially people uh, uh, were free to uh, move east of the Rockies. They could not go back to British Columbia where they were uh, originally from, but they could go east of the Rockies. Uh, many of the people who were on sugar beet farms began to move into Winnipeg. It was only in 1948 that the city of Winnipeg allowed Japanese to be able to live within Winnipeg and, and eventually buy property or rent homes. Uh, many of the women uh, worked in garment factories. That's about the only jobs they can get. Men worked in factories. Interesting enough, most of the employers who hired them were either of Jewish background or German background. Those are the only two companies that would hire Japanese at the time. Uh, so there's a lot of discrimination even at that point in terms of uh, towards uh, Asians and Japanese. We'll move into uh, the third panel or the fourth panel, sorry. I, I think the most important event in our community, which changed uh, uh, our community's attitudes and uh, uh, perceptions was the redress settlement. Uh, this is showing a march on Parliament Hill in 1988, it was April. And uh, on September 22nd, uh, Brian Mulroney, uh, who was a prime minister, signed the redress agreement uh, with the National Association of Japanese Canadians. And that settlement acknowledged that the government had done wrong. And as a result of its compensation for individuals, as well as for the community. And part of that settlement was the establishment of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. That was one issue that we pressed hard to have as some foundation uh, that would uh, be dealing with racism and discrimination. And the reason we felt that is because when we were trying to get funding to do the research for our experience, the government of Canada refused to uh, provide any funding for it. And we recognized that there was no place that we could go to. And we said, if we ever get a settlement, let's get a foundation for Canadians that other groups would be able to utilize when they came to issues such as racism and, and uh, discrimination by the government. So that's how that came about. But that's what's the turning point for our community because Finally, members of our community felt that they were partners within this country. Up to this point, they felt that they were enemies of Canada in a way because of the way they were treated. Panel five is the establishment of the Cultural Center uh, with the funding that came from the redress uh, agreement. Uh, there was a community fund and through the community fund, we were able to give funds to establish our present cultural centers. And today we have uh, fairly active communities, only 2,200 in our community. Unlike uh, what Perla was mentioning about the Filipino community, we are very small, but we are an active community. We take part in folklorama and all the cultural activities. And one of the main issues that we've been working on is really history preservation. And so we've uh, set up a digital archive within our uh, cultural center. We're collecting old photos and documents and we're trying to digitize all of it. Um, we could use a little help in terms of some of it because uh, we're having some difficulty in terms of the metadata, that type of thing. And maybe Stan, if you're listening in, uh, I may be able to contact you and uh, talk to you about that. But anyways, uh, we have established this particular website and uh, and uh, I'd like to talk about some of the project. The mural is part of the project uh, at, uh, of history preservation. But I'd like to move into the next panel, which is a project that we received funding from the National Cultural Support Program. And uh, what we're doing is we have five young Japanese Canadians who are producing films about their family. Uh, one of the things about the experience of Japanese Canadians when they were interned is that the parents 
rarely or never spoke of their past. And so we have younger people who are growing up, children of those families who never knew how they even ended up in Manitoba. And now we're into the fifth generation, which means that the grandchildren of those parents have very little knowledge of anything about their family. And so we felt that this project, if we could find young people who would be willing to do that. And so we do have five filmmakers here uh, who have created stories and uh, uh, they're listed uh, and uh, we're doing a premiere showing of their films actually uh, this coming weekend uh, at the Cultural Center. And I'll move into the next project that we're involved in, which is uh, the next panel. Uh, we are creating uh, short vignettes. Again, uh, very little no is known about our community um, and how they arrived here and what they've done. And so the purpose of this project is to capture a glimpse into the lives of Japanese Canadians through short vignettes and interviews. So if we can move on to the next panel. With the support of the Winnipeg Foundation Centennial Institute grant program, we're creating 12 short vignettes of approximately two minutes in length. And there were five interviews that we conducted uh, of individuals talking about their personal experiences in Manitoba when they first came. And so we uh, had this produced by Hugh Productions, which is Tracy Koga, who's a member of our community. The vignettes and personal interviews will be available on our website and YouTube and can be used as a teaching tool for school teachers and invaluable resources for events such as folkloramas or conferences or, uh, and other events. Uh, the short vignettes go into uh, little aspects of our community. So if we go on to the next panel, I'll give you some ideas. Uh, one of the vignettes is called Sugar Beets, Birth of a Community, and it shows how the sugar bees uh, from the movement of the sugar bees into Winnipeg and the formation of our community center and our community organization. Judo was introduced uh, in Manitoba by a, a Japanese Canadian. His name is Thomas Zou. Started up the judo club here. And so we have a little vignette on that. The kendo club is something that uh, uh, was established, uh, the first one in Manitoba. Taiko, very uh, intra. Taiko is an activity that's uh, gotten a lot of attention from other uh, people as well who take part in it. The Japanese garden, uh, for those who have never been to a cultural center, we do have a traditional small Japanese garden uh, that's located uh, on our property. Uh, we used to always, if you had attended Folklorama in the 80s, uh, we had a garden developed in the, uh, in the arena uh, to give an example of uh, our culture, but now we have one permanently. Uh, a little bit about the Buddhist church, because that's the first Buddhist church in uh, Manitoba as well. Uh, sharing our culture, uh, talking about folklorama, call to action. We are a member of the Indigenous Accord and some of the activities that we've done with the Indigenous community. And then we talk about the redress and then some vignettes on individuals. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of vignettes that we have. Next uh, section. So just to give you an idea, there's a Japanese garden on the right-hand side that you see that's part of our community. Um, Japanese pavilion, folklorama, and then there's a sign of the indigenous accord. So that sort of gives you a brief uh, uh, insight into the history preservation aspect of our community. We think that this is so important because as I mentioned, it's things, things such as this are not carried on that much unless we make an effort to ensure that people um, preserve it. And so that's uh, my presentation. I thank you all for listening. And uh, if there are questions later, I'd be willing to 
I'll certainly answer it. Thank you. And thank you very much, Art. It's inspiring to learn how far the Japanese Canadian heritage community has accomplished in spite of that ordeal that it went through during the war. And I, for one, am very eager to hear the questions and comments about your presentation. But for now, we will be moving on to our next speaker, Winnipeg-based independent filmmaker Nilofer Rockman. As a Canadian Muslim of Bangladeshi heritage, Nilofer views film as a powerful medium where diverse and marginalized voices can find expression. In 2010, she and her sister Saira established Snow Angel Films and have since produced well-received films such as Arctic Mosque, Prairie Mosque, and Letter to a Terrorist. I'm, it says here that the uh, trailer for Prairie Mosque will be uh, shown in quite a bit, but for now, please join me in welcoming Nilofer Rachman. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be a part of this uh, program today and also, also to be a part of this wonderful panel. Um, you'll have to forgive me, I haven't done something like this for a while. So if I go on all sorts of tangents, it's because uh, there's so many thoughts in my, in my head. Um, and I, am, I, I will be glancing down a little bit just because my notes are below, below. So just to uh, explain where my eyes are going. Um, so basically, I, I was really fortunate to um, grow up here in Treaty 1 territory, a beautiful place, beautiful people. And um, a lot of my experience was growing up in sort of in my Muslim community. Um, in terms of my heritage, my family is from what is now Bangladesh. And so I grew up with that culture as well. You know, when I was young, there were very few Bengali families here in Winnipeg and some were Muslim, some were Hindu. And my family, you know, my parents um, were good about mixing with everybody. Um, so we had a lot of exposure to culture growing up. Um, and then at a certain point, we also had exposure to our religious community. And uh, we started going to the mosque, which um, I have a poster back here of, of our film, Prairie Mosque. Uh, myself and my sister, Syra, uh, make films together. So um, we, we really felt sort of, um, you know, we've always felt a strong connection to the mosque community because we spent so much time there growing up. Um, really, it was like a second home. Uh, a lot of my best friends that I still have today were friends that I made in the mosque space. And the mosque space was extremely, and is extremely culturally diverse. You know, there are so many languages and cultures and, you know, even ways of practicing faith within, you know, the faith. There are different sects. I mean, it's largely Sunni um, in sort of, you know, a lot of the mosques we have, but at the same time, there are, you know, people who, who are, you know, as in any faith group, there is a large spectrum of how people approach faith. And, um, and so being exposed to that diversity within the community was really valuable. And, you know, it, it was a good thing and, and a hard thing at the same time. And it's something I really, um, you know, felt was important to, to talk about in, in the film that we made. So myself as, you know, an independent filmmaker and someone who's interested in history, I just felt sort of a motivation to delve a little more into our community history because, um, you know, our elders in the community, the ones who were sort of our community pioneers were passing, passing away and, and many people were moving away and sort of a lot of the archival uh, information that people have in their homes, in their basements, you know, all these documents, old newsletters, old photographs, you know, old Super 8 videos, whatever, like, they were sort of, they're, they're scattered, right? And they're um, a lot, you know, one auntie in the community had mentioned to me that as, as she was downsizing, she had thrown out a lot of photographs that she had um, in her collection. And this was an auntie who's been in the Muslim community for since the, I think, late 60s. 
And so I was just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> she threw the boat. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, might not think that, you know, these are just old photos that we had kicking around the house. They have no value or whatever. Um, they might not realize that they have tremendous value. Um, you know, so the future, looking back at this time, they capture the moments of this time. And so um, I, I kind of decided uh, that, you know, we need to, I almost felt responsible that I had to try and capture some firsthand um, stories and accounts of sort of the, the beginnings of our mosque community. And I mean, there's so much history. There's so many things you can focus on. I mean, Muslims have been um, in Manitoba for over a century. There is a long history there. And side note, actually, just recently, um, one of our uh, one of our important teachers in the community, Ismail Mukhtar, has just recently published a book, self-published actually, because you know it's hard to get funding for community histories. Um, he he's been he's been in the He's been in Winnipeg since the 80s, and he has a lot of wealth of information. And, you know, he decided to self-publish a history of uh, Manitoba Muslims. And it's a, like a 300-page book. It's got lots of photos and everything. So I encourage you to look that up. Um, so that was a side note. But, you know, obviously that, that book covers a lot more than as a filmmaker, I have to sort of focus in on specifics. So I sort of focused in on the building of the first mosque in Manitoba, which happened in 1976. And so the, um, the people that I interviewed and, and tried to get firsthand accounts were people sort of the pioneer generation of the first mosque, um, people who came in the sort of 50s and 60s. And uh, at that time, you know, there was only really a few families and um, they did gather in small spaces in each other's homes and in, in, in churches, um, in, you know, the international center. So, but they didn't have a space of their own and they really wanted to, um, you know, moving forward as, as a lot of these young families were having children, they realized that they need a space to, to pass on, you know, their culture, their language, um, their faiths. And so this, this was undertaken, this bill, it's, it's not a, a big space that we grew up in this mosque. It's, it was built on uh, two plots, two residential plots. It's in a residential area in St. Vital. Now there are many mosques around the city, um, but this one sort of is close to my heart um, because it's where I had spent so much time. So maybe before I go on, um, would this be a good place to show the trailer? Do you know what it is? I said, no. Do you know it is a minus 40? I said, no. I said, are you sure you can go there? I said, if somebody living there, I will be glad to go there. At that time, we didn't know where Winnipeg was. We didn't know even whether it existed, you know. We started to use the phone book to contact people with Muslim names. We prayed at St. Matthew's Church. We prayed at Unitarian Center. We prayed at International Center. We had no place to go to. But at the time, we decided that we needed our own, uh, you know, mosque. We knew we wanted a building, but we didn't have money. We started to make dinners and so on, and we sell tickets and, uh, and we made fashion shows, and we made about twelve dollars. You're exaggerating a little. There was much resistance to start with in the area. They didn't want the mosque to be built. Nobody knew about Islam. We walk by the mosque every day, right. and you wonder what's going on in here, what's inside. Forty years, it's not something that we could underestimate. You can travel all over the world, but the world is right here. Just go to the mosque. <laughs> you got the world. <laughs> Thank you for playing that. So I think from that little trailer, you kind of get a sense of how diverse our Muslim community is. And that, that kind of presents, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It also presents a, a challenge in a community. 
Um, that being, you know, especially a community like ours that is, you know, we're already marginalized sort of, you know, we're, we're a minority community. And, and because of the way, you know, because of the global politics and, um, you know, we, we suffer from needing to represent ourselves in a way that's positive because there's so much negative all the time. Um, so people really within the community, they want to have a positive representation and people, you know, often individuals feel this huge burden of representing the community, right? Um, but at the same time, when you're part of a community, you know that it's not all positive and there are issues within your community that you would like to talk about because if you don't talk about them, if you hide them, if you shove them under the rug, then things won't get better and things won't change within your own community. So there's this challenge, there's this sort of duality of forces that are like um, making it difficult to, to represent. So, uh, you know, and there's also community politics, right? There's, there's this thing where people, especially documenting histories, people want to leave a legacy. You know, there, there are people within the community that want to be able to say, yes, I was part of building this or I was part of doing this. And yes, there are so many people who play critical roles within a community. Um, and it's, you know, as much as we can, as people who try and document this, as much as we want to, you know, put, get everyone's name out there and, and cover as much as possible. It's very difficult. You know, you, you might leave, you might leave people out. And, um, and so what I kind of decided, you know, throughout this process of making this film was that, you know, we're not going to be able to capture everything. And um, we, we kind of have to focus on capturing the spirit of that time, that sort of Genesis period of the building of this first mosque. And if we can, through, you know, several interviews, um, capture the spirit of that time, um, you know, then hopefully that will, for future generations looking back, it will be something that they can treasure. And I really wanted to pay tribute, you know, to the people who were a part of it. I, I benefited a lot from, from this space. You know, it gave me a sense of belonging. It helped me find a, a community and friends. Um, it helped me to shape my identity. It also was challenging because, you know, there are a lot of people you don't agree with um, uh, because there's such a diverse, you know, uh, uh, amount of opinions. Um, you know, there, there are ethics when you try and document these stories. There are also ethics involved. You know, religiously, we're taught, um, you know, that we should cover people's faults. You know, we should hide each other's faults. So when I do interviews, and there's some people talking about other people and saying, oh, he did this or they did that or, you know, they shouldn't have done this. When you, you know, so there's all this stuff that comes out. Right. And there's all this politics. So I kind of I kind of decided that I was going to try and um, address issues in a way that wasn't sort of maligning. <laughs> I was like, don't wanna, we're 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 part of living history. Right. These people are still living. Um, you don't want to affect people in a negative way. So. Uh, the process of, of sort of documenting the history of our community was really challenging for all these reasons um, and more. Um, but at the same time, it was something I felt like I really, I wanted to do. It was a labor of love. Um, I think with community, you know, I, for myself, I feel like I really love community. I don't always like everything about it because there are challenges, um, but it's important. It's been an important part of my life. And the more I come to learn about the history of my community and, and share it with others, the more we all realize that there are so many things that connect us because people who have watched this film have said, you know, who are not Muslim have said, oh, that's my community too. Um, so there's, there's much more to connect us than to divide us. And so um, I, I might have gone over time, my apologies, but uh, thank you again for letting me share. And uh, at some point, I'll give you information on where you can watch the film. Thank you. And thank you, Neil Nilifer, for sharing how you harness the medium of film to give the Bangladeshi Canadian heritage community a distinct voice in Manitoba's cultural mix. It was great to see that clip of Prairie Mosque and hearing about the challenges faced by your community's pioneering generation. Um, it's also good to see a phone book again. It's been a while since I've seen one. Moving on to our fourth and last speaker, we have Nadia Thompson. 
Nadia is dedicated to the promotion of black culture and history throughout Winnipeg. She joined the Black History Month Celebration Committee in 2009, helping organize various events throughout the, the city. She continues to work with multiple organizations to promote diversity and culture in Winnipeg, connecting with, the, with various community groups to build a better connection in our city. Nadia has been the chairperson for the BHMCC for several years and put so much heart into this role. She has been the face of Black History Month celebrations by attending events all over the city and country. She has been interviewed on Breakfast Television, CBC Radio, Global News, CJOB, to name a few, and continues to expose the city to the vast array of information available throughout Winnipeg about Black history and Black culture. Her impact on our city has been evident. If you don't know her name, you know, you know the face because she's everywhere. She's part of her heritage and her background. She truly cares about who people are and what mark we leave on this world. So, please welcome, please help me welcome Nadia Thompson. Glad to have you with us, Nadia. Thank you so much, Chris. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. I get the privilege of going into your lunches, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I, I really um, I'm going to be as brief as possible. I just want to give a little bit of information about who we are and what we do. Um, Black History Manitoba has been in conception now for we celebrated our 40th anniversary this year. So a lot of people may not understand or know who we are, just because also we have a name change that took place last year. So we used to be considered the Black History Celebration, sorry, Black History Month Celebration Committee, which um, we changed that because it limited us. We wanted to make sure that we were a little bit more diverse um, and we wanted people to understand that we are accessible 365 days a year because we are focused on the history, um, not just the month. So we took the opportunity to do a revamp and changed our name. So we are now known as Black History Manitoba. Um, back in 1989, we um, had a gentleman in our community, his name was Wade Kojo Williams Sr. And he decided amongst many other of our staple and veteran community members to take it upon themselves to celebrate Black History Month here in Winnipeg. Um, a little brief history. Um, the celebration of Black History Month began in 1926 and was started by Carter G. Woodson, a Black scholar, educationalist, and historian. At that time, um, it was observed as Negro History Week, which was changed to a full month in celebration um, of uh, black people in 1976, when the US president officially declared February to be Black History Month. The two men were changed their lives of black Americans um, was Abraham Lincoln, the former president and the creator of the Emancipation Proclamation, um, who was born in February, and also Frederick Douglass, a former slave and an abolitionist and a politician born in, on, in February also. Uh, one was February 12th and the other was February 14th. So they honor and that is why February was chosen. So for those, that's a little tidbit of Black history. Um, the United States and Canada celebrate Black History Month, um, also sometimes known as African Heritage Month during February, to remember the importance of people in history of African and to celebrate the archives of the African Americans. In Canada, officially recognition of, sorry, in Canada officially recogni recognized the first um, settler to Canada in the early 1600s. And once they realized that this was, it took a long time for us to actually celebrate officially Black History Month in Winnipeg, um, sorry, directly um, back in the, I think it was 2016, Black History Celebrations was kind of brought forth to be more of a citywide celebration. It was 
a lot of done, lots of events and stuff were done within the black community and it wasn't widespread. So um, officially for the national recognition was February or December 14th in 1995, when the House of Commons um, unanimous, unanimously agreed to the motion formally recognizing Black History Month and the importance of Black history for all Canadians. So um, we've been able to, as my introduction had talked about, get a lot more advertising and a lot more promotion about Black history because of what we do as a group. Um, the group itself, we have about 16 members, volunteers that make up the committee itself. And most of our members are veterans. So they have been with the group for more than 30 years. Um, and when we talk about creating a, a more diverse, a more culturally accepting and a mu more multicultural society in Winnipeg and Manitoba, Black history becomes a very important way to do that. If you know more about who you're sitting next to, who your neighbors are, who you're, you're walking by on the street, it's easier for you to be that more connective um, as a society. So we have taken Black history and made it a little bit more of a universal, a little bit more um, fun because a lot of our projects and a lot of our activities are directed to our young people. Um, we were able to use this pandemic as a stepping stone to connect with some of our schools and our businesses to celebrate and um, diversify our portfolio of what the projects that we do. So we have our staple projects that we do every year in February, which are our opening ceremonies, our history lesson, we have a community concert, a youth debate, and uh, that's just to name a few. So we've connected with several different organizations and businesses throughout the city that continue to help support us and give us new ideas of how to communicate Black history within the wider community. So we take pride in going to schools and talking about things that they do not teach in our history books, which is very relevant to our community and to our city as we are doing a walk to try to eliminate racism in our city. Um, we have such a diverse community in, in Winnipeg and I think our black community as it continues to grow um, we continue to motivate each other to accept change, accept um, diversity and, and learn. So our education is one of our main priorities with the group that we have and building bridges and connecting the dots of our history within our indigenous, our Asian communities, our um, European communities, et cetera. So we have a great group of people. And um, again, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm not going to take up too much more. Um, we do have a website. If you happen to want to talk about um, anything, if we can come to your organization to share some more information and to get more details about Black history, um, if your schools are not giving you or your students for your children, the information that they require, that's what we are there for. So we are able to be reached. Our, our website is there. Our email address is available. We're on all of the social medias. Um, our main focus is to try to get more information out there. I caught the very tail end of the gentleman that was speaking regarding archiving and our history is a lot of different people in our community coming together. I know a few people have mentioned talking about how do we preserve what we have. And I, I res resonated with the, the last speaker. We have a lot of members of our communities with pictures, with brochures and programs from um, historical events um, that had taken place over the, the course of the last 40 to 50 years, and they don't know what to do with it. 
So those connections that we have with the historic society would be to grow those archives and create a space where we are able to um, provide that information in one of those uh, facilities because it is important. Um, if you go to one of our, any of our museums, the, the lack thereof of diversity is, is evident. And we want to make sure that, that we can do something to help get that, uh, to change that. So um, again, I hope that we have um, given you a little bit of a glimpse. I'm sorry that we, we don't have enough time to go into that much detail, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and I hope that you will be able to look us up, um, www.bhmwinnipeg.com and definitely reach out if you have need for any more information about Black History Manitoba. Thanks, Chris. And thank you so much, Nadia. It's wonderful to learn about your community's many accomplishments over the years. And it's also admirable that you're able, you said you're able to use the pandemic to even diversify your programming and reach a wider audience. So I just wanted to note that. So now we know, we move on to the question and answer portion of this discussion. So uh, I know there's been a, a, a lot of comments and um, mostly comments sprinkled throughout the chat box so let me just uh, quickly um, read them through like starting with the uh, the first um, presenter Perla Habate, uh, from Janet LaFrance I love recovering Filipino on CBC uh, and then uh, your presentation brings back vivid memories of the late Dante Benaventura also from uh, about arts uh, about arts presentation we have a photo of this is also from Janet LaFrance we have a photo of Japanese workers on a farm in a Francophone community in our archives dated sometime in the 1940s. And uh, there's a there's a question there, where's the mural? So I think this is a question directed to Art. Would you like to uh, answer this, Art? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'd be interested in that photo that uh, was just mentioned about uh, farmers on the sugar beet farm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether uh, I could get access to it somehow. So if the, uh, the person who, uh, uh, oh, okay, Janet. Yeah, if you could send it to me, that would be great. Uh, I'm at uh, artmickey at mymts.net, which uh, is fairly easy. But that's the kind of thing that we want is to collect uh, photos uh, of people. We don't have that many of uh, people on the farms, to tell you the truth. And so it'd be good. I, I'm just wondering too, whether there are farmers who had taken pictures uh, of the people as well, but you know, we don't have access to it. So, but I'm glad to hear uh, Janet, I'd be really interested uh, in getting that. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Art. Thanks for answering that question. Now, this question is directed to Nilofer, I believe. Uh, will the films be available online? I don't know if you already answered this, Nilofer. Please. I did put, uh, thanks for your question. I, I put a link there. Um, Prairie Mosque is available on uh, Vimeo On Demand. So um, there is a small fee for renting. Um, there's also, if you scroll down the page, you'll see, it, you'll see um, some small vignettes and they're just free because we couldn't put everything in the film. So we wanted to be able to have sort of glimpses of people's different stories. And uh, so we created some small vignettes and that's something I'm hoping to continue to do as part of a larger project. So the film is just sort of the film, but you know, there's so many stories and, and uh, visual history that I'd like to still develop. Um, so we have a few sort of uh, vignettes on there and yeah, so that's where the link is. And there's also another question for you, uh, Nilofer. Have your full interviews been archived? This is from Sarah Story. Uh, sorry, have. So uh, I believe. Uh, oh, the full interviews yeah. that I recorded. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't done that. I was thinking about doing it, but there were, you know. Uh, it's interesting because as, you know, as someone who grew up in the community, I, you know, one of the reasons why I did this project was because I, I was able to get access, you know, to these unique 
stories and voices. And part of that access came with a certain level of trust. Um, and so although I did record full interviews, um, you know, there were things that people uh, either they told me that they didn't want to be shared, you know, after the fact, after they said it on, on camera. Um, and also there are things that, and maybe this is me sort of interfering with the process a bit, but there are things that I feel that they might have said that maybe um, they, they wish they hadn't. <laughs> and, and that was just me knowing because I know them personally, or they, I know, I know situations in our community that if, if something were to be heard by others, it might reflect badly on them. And because these are all living, you know, voices and, you know, I, I kind of made some judgment calls and I think maybe that's what we do sometimes. Um, so I do have, although I have uh, larger interviews um, that maybe I will create larger sections to put online eventually, I haven't done so yet. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that was a good thing or not, but anyways, that's my honest answer. <laughs> no, thank you for answering all those questions, Nilofer. And now we have one more. I believe we have time for one more. This is directed to uh, Perla Havate from Shelly Sweeney. Uh, Perla, do you know what happened to the archives of the Filipino community that had been collected in the 80s and 90s? You can unmute your mic, Tita Perla. <laughs> Um, I really don't know. I know that there are uh, a couple of books that were written and uh, most likely with the interviews that has happened, it's been compiled through the books that uh, was written by Gemma de la Yuan, And I know there was one written by Kato Buduhan before that, I think in the eighties. Um, and other than that, uh, all others are still probably in the process because of uh, the rich materials that were uh, got, that we can gather from um, the newspapers that we had in the seventies and in the eighties and nineties. All right. Thank you very much, Sita Perla. And uh, I have to apologize because we are short on time. And if you have any other questions that might arise, um, the organizers will, I'm sure the organizer will make uh, the panelists' email uh, addresses available so you can send your questions to them. So at this point, let me just thank all of our panelists for their participation and to our viewers for their uh, attention. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day learning and sharing in today's summit. So now I turn back to you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, I see, Chris, you did a wonderful job at managing that. Thank you to all the panelists. That was extremely interesting. And, um, well, I'm sure I, I feel my stomach grumbling. Uh, your, your stomach might be too. So it is lunchtime, and we will t make sure we take a lunchtime, all right? Which means that uh, for a moment, you need to step away from your, your computer. It's for your own health and for your own good. Um, so we're going to be uh, taking that break all the way till 1230. Uh, at 12.30, you can still be fully on your lunch if you want to go outside. It's not looking that nice, but if you want to go outside, that, that might be a good idea. But if you want to get back to us at 12.30 to watch some videos, we're going to have some videos throughout the, the lunch time. And at 1 o'clock, we are starting up again um, with the more panelists, and the conference will be starting up officially at 1. So again, you've got till 12.30 if you want to watch some videos. You've got till 1 um, if uh, you want to take your full lunch. Alors, allez-y, prenez votre temps. Vous avez jusqu'à 1h, uh, 23h. Uh, sinon, à midi et demi, on va, on, va, on va jouer des vidéos si vous voulez venir manger avec nous. Alors, c'est ça. Uh, je vais vous rappeler avec la musique encore. Vous allez l'entendre. Don't worry, you're going to hear the music at 1 o'clock when it's time to come back. So, bon appétit!